let everybody in. I'll go ahead and disable the waiting room. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, um, welcome to our February meeting of the Salt Lake City R user group. We are so glad that you're all here. We will um, we will probably just uh, do a little bit of um, organizing and whatnot as we let people roll in. We're just at barely like a minute past the hour now. Um, we are, um, I'll share a few links as we get started here. I'm sure that you all found us because of the meetup group, but um, I'll, I think you had to to be able to get the Zoom link, but um, um, that is here where we have um, all the details of how to find us and um, what we're up to and all that. Um, we are really glad that you have joined us, whether you are part of our local Utah um, our community or you've joined us from further away. Um, the, uh, I'm going to drop a link um, where we're lucky to not have had any problems, um, um, but I'm going to drop a link to the R Consortium um, Community Code of Conduct here. Um, this is a professional um, space and um, we as organizers will be um, um, uh, moderating. Um, and so we appreciate you um, uh, and, and that we really appreciate that we have not had any problems in this during these all these months of, um, of moving online. So but I'm going to drop that there as um, you know how we uh, run our meetings um, here in this in this online space. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do today. So um, over the past couple of years for our first meeting of 2021, which this is for us, we had a meeting in December and then took February off. And then this is the first meeting of us for 2021. Um, over the past several years, we have done the first meeting of the year as um, lightning talks, which has been a really exciting and interesting way to be able to um, hear from different people in the community, um, uh, give, be able to give um, short talks, um, uh, telling us a little bit about um, um, a project they've worked on, um, uh, a package that they've learned how to use, um, uh, some new techniques that they've been able to use. Not in like a whole, you know, whole lunchtime talk kind of situation, but just a little bit of a snippet. They've been really um, fun and interesting talks, um, sessions when I've gotten uh, exposed to a lot of different ideas. And I'm really glad that we kind of have started this tradition and have kept it up. So this, um, uh, like in, in previous years, the, these talks will be um, five to seven minutes. I, I am going to uh, get, get on my timer because we do have to keep them to five to seven minutes to get through everybody in within an hour, which we definitely want to do that because we are, you know, know that everyone is, um, uh, you know, is, has got work and all that kind of thing. So I am going to be um, uh, doing the stopwatch thing as we get through these. And so today we have, just like in previous years, we have um, five talks, which at seven minutes should be able to, we should be able to get through these. Um, what we're going to do for questions is, is um, uh, if you have a question as um, we are um, going through these, if you can um, type it into Zoom, preferably um, um, you with the person's name, um, which should be, you know, on their slides and on their Zoom um, uh, name. Um, then if we are doing okay on time, we'll maybe take one or two questions between talks. And um, if we're a little pressed for time, we will um, come back. We will come to them at the end if we are able to do that. So that is the plan. And um, we are hoping to record this and post this on our YouTube site. Um, so please be aware of that um, as you choose to um, have your video on or off. Um, so please be aware of that. All right, so I think let's get started. So our first talk, which I have been excited to hear because this is something I'd like to learn more about how to do, is from Haroon Acha. And um, Haroon's gonna be speaking about um, diagrammer. 
um, and being able to uh, be more reproducible with how we make diagrams. So Haroon, if you can get started, we are excited to hear from you. Great, thank you for having me. My name is Haroon Atcha. I work as a qualitative data scientist at Salt Lake Community College. And today I'd like to talk about the Diagrammer package, which is a package that I've gotten a lot of use out of lately. Um, so uh, often in the course of research, whether you're more quantitatively based or just do qualitative stuff and like to use R, you'll have the need to make figures and flow charts that other tools in R aren't really equipped to handle or produce particularly well. So most people use ggplot to make visualizations that are data-based, but a lot of the time uh, ggplot doesn't really handle things like flowcharts particularly well. You can certainly finagle them to look like a flowchart, but it's, it's not really intuitive or easy to get to that. There are some existing tools to accomplish this. For example, draw.io is probably one of the most popular tools that you can use. It's pretty easy and relatively robust, and you can export files out of and into draw.io. There are also a number of GUI-based apps online that you can use that you just put in your nodes and your connections, and it'll produce a network diagram or flowchart in whatever visual style that the website was kind of coded to do. And if you're a real masochist, you can use MS Paint um, and create a flowchart, um, but that's only for the very dedicated. I, I don't recommend that. However, there are a few problems with creating flowcharts and network diagrams in this way. First of all, it's not really reproducible. This problem is especially uh, emphasized when you use other GUI-based apps because it's kind of a black box. You don't understand what's happening. And if you rely on a peer review process, you wanna be able to peer review kind of everything that you're producing, not just the data-driven graphs. Uh, moreover, it's difficult to tweak individual elements, and it becomes exponentially more difficult the more nodes and items you have in your chart. Especially if you add additional layers onto your diagram, it's hard to get to that bottom or first layer and just like change the color of one node. Um, and lastly, it's hard to integrate. Don't know why I wrote integrate, but it's hard to integrate that into your R Markdown workflow. Um, if you write your reports in R Markdown, um, Odds are you have lots of data chunks going into that. And it's helpful to be able to, you know, not just import a PNG into your markdown file, but natively create that in the file itself. So you don't have to go to five different places to peer review things. Diagrammer, the package, pretty much solves these problems in a pretty good way. Uh, Diagrammer is a package that allows you to programmatically generate flowcharts, diagrams, and other graphs. And it's useful for workflow and methods charts. For example, if you do qualitative stuff, you can make a flowchart of what your method for assessing robustness was. Or if you do data or database stuff, you can plot the steps in importing data into your warehouse, for example. And more interestingly, you can make network diagrams very easily, um, which is probably the most exciting part of this package that you'll see in a second. Um, and for my purposes, you visualize qualitative research really well. Most of the time when people do research, it's a process and visualizing that process really gets that point across better than just writing it out. So I wanna show you two cases for what you can use the diagrammer package to do. And the first case is to produce a DAG, a directed acyclical graph. If you are a researcher in the social sciences, you are probably very familiar with these. But in general, you just wanna see what the relationship between your variables that you're gonna put into your theoretic, in your model are, and you want to be able to identify confounders. There are, again, a couple of apps that do DAGs specifically, but they're not very pretty. Um, so Diagrammer uses the dot language to create these charts, which is not very difficult to use. And there are some features that are really interesting and helpful. For example, you can tweak standard visual variables like color, fill, size, and text, all those variables that you've gotten used to in ggplot. Um, but you can do other things that are specific to flowcharts as well. You can make subclusters and sub-subclusters and change things like the orientation of your flowchart. Um, and so the case that we're looking at, what is a causal chain connecting internet access to collective violence? This was my dissertation project. And so you can see here that we have two subclusters, access variables and environmental variables that we'll wanna control for. And then your independent variable, which is internet penetration and your dependent variable, which is ethnic riots, right? This is the DAG that was in my dissertation. And it took about, I don't know, 30 lines of code to accomplish this, very reproducible. 
The other case that I'd like to present is network diagrams. And this is really one of the core strengths of the diagrammer package. Um, and so over the summer, I read a book that had the recollections of former high school students in Topaz internment camp. So it was about 30 of these chapters and these people were about 60 to 80 years old, but there were high schoolers in Topaz internment camp. And what struck me is that all of these students mentioned each other in their recollections, right? Like, oh, I went to the dance with so-and-so. I was great friends with another person. And I thought to myself, this sounds like an adjacency matrix. So I read through that book, made an adjacency matrix and added some metadata variables. Let me scroll in a little bit. But pretty much all you need to pass to Diagrammer is a nodes data frame and an edges data frame with all of your metadata appended to those, depending on, for example, do you want edges to be a certain color or a length? So in this diagram, the shape of the nodes varies on gender and the color of the nodes varies on what year did they graduate from Topaz High School. Um, and so it's a little more like work than ggplot where you could just pass the whole data frame to um, the function and it'll produce these things. But in principle, it's the same. And if you're familiar with ggplot, it'll be very easy for you. Also, uh, Diagrammer uses a number of different engines to generate the layout of your network diagram. So you saw this one, which is one of those engines. I don't remember which one I used, um, but using a different engine can drastically change the visuals of your network diagram. Um, this is the dot engine. So a little more of a cluster fudge. Um, you have the two pi engine, which tries to organize things radially. And then you have the Circo engine, which does something similar, but with no overlap, right? When you use different engines, some tweaking of visual parameters may be necessary. Um, these engines are pretty different from each other and produce different layouts. So Diagrammer is useful for a number of things. First of all, it's useful for making network diagrams, which look pretty cool, I think, and are probably one of the more robust packages for making static network diagrams in R right now. There are a couple of other ones, but I think this one is the most uh, robust so far. Moreover, it can help you make flowcharts for your workflow or your data processes. And lastly, it can help you to visualize things that you probably don't think are visualizable in the packages that you're used to, like ggplot right now. Um, and yes, that's the diagrammer package. I hope you start using it because it's fantastic. And I think it's going into 1.0 soon, if it's not already there. Awesome. That's super interesting. The thing that I find most compelling about that is um, like the reproducibility aspect because I um, like I, I have, um, you know, gone to some of those other tools for like flow charts and things and being able to have that as in my R Markdown document for like a flow chart describing some process. Uh, I guess that's a really compelling idea. Thank you so much for that, Haroon. And you were like 705. So congratulations on that. <laughs> All right. Our next speaker is um, Tom Meyer. And Tom is going to be speaking to us about on the really important topic of um, algorithmic bias. So Tom, if you can unmute and, um, and share your screen, we'll get started with your talk. Okay. So um, just before I share my screen, I wanted to make a plug for the book, Data Feminism which is just amazing. So uh, data feminism, nice. not hard to remember, but it goes way beyond feminism. All right, so share screen and here we are. Da, 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 da. And okay, so um, I have a, just a quick thing here. Uh, actually, this is more like two different talks put together, but I'll do them each really quickly so that we don't have to have Julia saying, uh-oh, too long. Um, so algorithm bias or algorithmic bias is what people usually say, but I think that's a real mouthful. And since my consultancy is called Research Stats Algorithm Bias, I'll just go ahead with algorithm bias. So in this uh, picture here is uh, some uh, undocumented 
young people who were going to a DACA demonstration and they have um, butterflies. So to demonstrate that they're dreamers. So yikes, yikes, here we have what's going on here. You see articles saying the computer is rejecting your job application. The New York Times, where do vaccine doses go and who gets them? The algorithms decide. Well, that's interesting. So um, the definition of algorithms is a sequence of steps to move toward a goal. And that could be all kinds of things. It doesn't have to be um, something that's computerized, but that's how usually it's thought of these days. Usually it's uh, making decisions. So you could use algorithms. Here's, uh, this is in the, I was able to go to the kingdom of Tonga. This is uh, Lavinia Taomoe Piau Latu in the National Emergency Management Office uh, trying to project where hurricane disaster relief is needed. So that's the kind of algorithm that's really helpful. We've heard about algorithms in um, medicine, like trying to do a better job of reading images uh, like um, mammograms or lung cancer, things like that. So algorithms certainly have a good thing. And those of you at Salt Lake Community College will know that they've been trying to or we're trying to probably have it figured out now, figure out which students need extra help within three weeks of the beginning of the semester so that they don't uh, go ahead and fail. The prediction would be that they would fail, but uh, there's a warning from the algorithm uh, saying these students need extra help. Okay, so. So lots of good things for algorithms. So why are we talking about bias? Um, I have here on one side of the screen, uh, I did my own analysis of the death rates in Utah by race and ethnicity using the data on the Utah Department of Health. And that was as of the middle of November. So you can see the blue part is non-Hispanic whites and if you have that as a reference, Pacific Islanders four times more deaths uh, on a proportional basis, um, Native or American Indians three and a half, Hispanic or Latino almost two, Asian more, and uh, as different from the rest of the country, Black and African American, which I believe is related to companies doing a really, really strong push to bring in uh, Black people for diversity from across the country. So these are younger people working, have insurance. So that's my hypothesis. So um, decision-making processes over here can have biased input, biased assumptions built in, and therefore biased output. So someone may say, well, I build just great predictive models and the political parties use ways of, with likely voters of figuring out who's going to vote. Um, those models were traditionally built by white men from come from families of voters. So they might not consider that an approach like Stacey Abrams in Georgia or the Latin and um, Native, Indigenous, Indian organizers in Arizona for years have just been working and working and working on helping people see how their vote matters, getting them registered, that kind of thing. So the algorithm isn't really useful, but this really hard time consuming method disrupts the algorithm. Okay, so this data feminism book does say that values are built into everything we do. And it's interesting that Haroon mentioned Topaz. This is a picture that I took at the site of the Topaz internment camp, the Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II. About 10,000 were at Topaz or almost 10,000. And um, something for us to remember is data science for whom 
they're never neutral and the data are people. So those are things to remember. I'll let you read this. If we think of a, hung, of a country with hungry people and people who don't have a place to live, that's not a good sign. So if we can think about where our data is coming from then our regression models, our um, machine learning or artificial intelligence, those kinds of things may, um, just to think about, what are we doing? So, so that's my talk. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tom. One thing that um, <clears throat> that I think is really interesting as we all think about like the data we deal with, the things we're doing is like like data science for whom and what's going on with the um, the 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 kind of work that we do and what are like what are the assumptions that um, that that are going on underneath underneath that. That was really um, uh, great to hear from you. Thank you so much for preparing that. Um, so as you work on um, unsharing there, um, the um, the our next speaker is Bill Prisby. So Bill is going to be, um, you know, it's I just kind of need to see the connections that we have here. Um, Bill is going to be talking about um, COVID. We just saw some examples of COVID data, um, and he's Bill is specifically going to be talking about um, COVID screening and using um, breath metrics. So um, Bill, if you want to get unmuted and share your screen, we would love to hear from you. Okay, let's see if this works. You guys are all seeing blue. Looks like we're good. Yeah, we see, we got that. Okay, great. Let me get my timer over here so I don't go over. All right. Okay, my name is Bill, Bill Prisbury. I'm going to be talking about detecting COVID from Sorry, breath. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> oh, what? I said, sorry, I said your name wrong. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's fine. Everybody gets it wrong. So a little bit about my background. I got my uh, chemical engineering way back when, picked up an MBA. Went to the University of Utah for a master's in information systems. Uh, one of my job experiences was strategic foresight, using R to look at the data of all the media patterns and predicting it, which was really fascinating. Uh, what I'm looking for in this little five minutes, I'm working for a startup. And so we're looking for investors. I'm looking for advice. And we're also looking for programmers. So what that means is when you look at this, if you can answer, if you can fill in any of these blanks, please send me a message because I'd really like to hear about it. Uh, absolutely contact me, um, either email or my phone number. Okay, diving in, first of all, a visual metaphor for what programming R feels like for me. And I wonder if I'm the only one. Uh, and the answer is, if you're doing it right, it feels like chewing rocks. Uh, let's get on to the question at hand here, which is, can you detect COVID from exhaled breath? And the answer is, you betcha. There at the bottom left, I've got a confusion matrix, which I don't quite have the time to walk over. That's unfamiliar to folks. But I draw your attention to the accuracy in the lower right. We're at 89% accuracy. Uh, let me tell you how that works. We've got about $4 million in research into a University of Utah patent. It uses artificial intelligence, uses nanotechnology, the nanotubes in the center, and it picks up a biomarkers in your breath. We run it through our device to make the measurement. The device pushes to the cloud. Currently, it's MySQL. We run R Connect to walk through an R Markdown script, uh, and then it spits back our answer. So a metaphor for how it works is you can think of those nanotubes as a field of grass. And you think of the biomarkers, which are molecules, it turns out we all exhale about 30,000 different biomarkers in our breath. Every biological process in your body has got a, uh, a waste molecules it produces or sideways molecules that produces. We all have to get out of the body somehow. So you can think of that molecule as like a kite. 
and that kite is flying over the grassy field, and that grassy field is our sensor. Every now and then that kite is going to brush the grass, and when it brushes the grass, it creates an electric signal. So we keep track of those electric signals, and then we predict on that. Uh, here is a, an example of what one of our actual traces looks like. Close enough, we're a little disguised for the public presentation. Uh, we run a variety of voltages, about a minute to a minute and a half, and we measure the variances in the micro, in the amps versus the volts. So now I've got a prediction problem with 60,000, or sorry, 6,000 pieces of data to predict on. Uh, to do zoom in a little bit on there, each little step there is an actual step with each second we, we change our, uh, our voltage. Uh, we're focusing on three main areas to improve our accuracy. One is to get more data. It's always hard to measure this. Uh, two, we look at the transformations we used before we run the algorithm, the data prep side, and then lastly is the algorithm. So I'm gonna focus a little bit on the transformations Looking at my time, still going to keep talking a mile a minute here. Uh, there's some examples of our raw traces, and there's an example of our transformation. What we did in this transformation is we took the average per step, or we reduced it from 6,000 measurements to 60 measurements. Then we can predict on that. Uh, another one we do is we look at where the entire line is at, and we take an average measurement. I call it the pre average because it's not over the entire trace and then we can use that to scale up and down so for example if we go from our transformation which i called moab then we can center that to our transformation called topaz where you can see that i've shifted the whole line down to zero and that has some accuracy boosts for us uh, that's it is compared to the raw. I'm going to skip past that so here's some of our results from our different methods from our different uh, transformations and our breath patterns. You can see here our, our feldspar has the highest accuracy and a great uh, kappa result. Uh, so to conclude, can you detect COVID from infection from an infected, sorry, can you detect COVID infection from an exhaled breath? The answer is yes. And that was a mile a minute. I actually got 30 seconds for questions. Yeah, you do. That's that, that was incredible. Very excellent. Excellent job. That's super interesting. So um, I, as, I don't know if um, <clears throat> other people have uh, questions here, but I so this I'll be honest, this is the first I've heard about, I mean, this kind of diagnostic and I, I've been pretty up. I've been pretty, you know, like most people obsessively reading and um, all this kind of thing. Um, so you said, you know, you're working on a patent, you're like, you know, starting a company, um, uh, all this kind of thing. Um, so um, it, are, are there, is there kind of like, um, uh, like, like new kinds of diagnostics, like just kind of like growing up in this industry right now? Uh, yes, that's a great question to lead in for the next step. Uh, COVID hit us like an asteroid, like it did everybody else, and it was never actually in our original game plan. Most of our original research was around tuberculosis, but we decided to see if we could do COVID. Uh, we hit a pretty quick wall, though, in that there was enough COVID uh, snake oil salesmen there that no one wanted to take an untried technology yeah. to the market. Uh, and a lot of doors closed for us right off the bat. Uh, and so because of that, we switched our focus to bacteria um, there at the bottom, third from the bottom, third from the top, sorry. Uh, and we made some great progress in detecting a bacterial contamination in food products. And so we're, we're, we're actually gonna send three units to India to continue with tuberculosis. We're gonna send a unit to a uh, US food corporation and they're gonna use it in their they're going to sniff food products and see if we have a little bit of uh, of contamination there. That's really interesting. Um, let's take one more. Mark has a question here. Um, we have a question like, how fast is the turnaround on that? So like you have the breath that gets detected. You have some model that is in the you know device. Is um, like, how fast does the result come back? Uh, three minutes from start okay. to finish. Okay. 
No, it's really yeah. interesting. Well, Bill, that is super interesting um, to hear about. Uh, thank you for, I, I don't know if you want to put on your slide your contact info again, or if you, or yeah. actually, why don't you, you can drop it in the chat. Um, so why don't you stop sharing yeah. and you drop your contact info in the chat as, um, as a, uh, um, we get our next speaker um, ready to go. So that way people can, if they're interested in learning more about getting in touch with you, either for any of those things that you talked about, they're able to, but that's really interesting to get um, to, to hear more about. Um, so thanks for sharing with that. Our um, fourth um, and uh, second to last speaker is um, uh, Laura Southard. I'm um, excited about this one because I, um, I, this is something that I do a fair amount, either before teaching or um, my own understanding of the problem that I'm doing. And so I think it's something that I just think more people should talk about and should talk about how to do um, because like the barrier is not that high, but you can do so much when you learn a little bit more. So I'm really excited that Laura is here to talk about um, uh, animation with ggplot2. So um, Laura, let's get you unmuted and um, uh, doing your presentation. Thank you, Julia. Yeah, I um, use this as kind of my first dip into animation. So I've done like tutorials and stuff, but never uh, really got into it. I never had a problem that I thought would fit it. And now I see every problem. Uh, I think my whole team knows this. We see every problem. It's like, this could be a potential animation, which is fun. Uh, so yeah, I'll just get, go ahead and get right, right to it. So um, the data that I received was uh, Denver eviction data. There was two separate sets. It was January 2019 to June 2019, and then January 2020 to August 2020. And of course, nothing really lined up except for the dates of the filings, which was good. Uh, but otherwise, everything else was a mess. Um, and that was to be expected. It was, it was scraped off the web. Um, and there was an eviction moratorium that was implemented in 2020 in response to COVID. And so the real question was, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, how did that impact eviction filings? And so I created this final product that you see on the right, uh, just to get a glimpse at what's going on with this data, what was happening and where those changes happen. And you can definitely see when that uh, moratorium took place in the disperses of the lines. So in order to do that, um, I had to format the data for the visualization. And so I pulled apart the date into year and month. Uh, I summarized the counts by month and then got a cumulative sum for each succeeding month and then created kind of a little hack. So always happy to hear uh, updates, but a little hack for those labels. Uh, so to format the date, uh, it was crucial that I, I needed R to understand that this was a date, but I didn't need all that extra information. So if you recall, it had a timestamp on it, a year, a month, and date, but I didn't need that for all the grouping. So I used this um, uh, post six function in order to pull apart just the date and then I could use the latter part where it says format equals and on the on the left you can see I put format equals percent y for just year or percent m for just month uh, and I actually got that off of um, something from stack overflow which is super helpful and really exciting uh, and then the rest of this code was just to format and group the code some arithmetic to get the cumulative sum by group uh, and then I created labels and so I tried a couple different approaches for these labels uh, but I came up with just a case win because it wasn't computationally that different. However, always excited to hear other ideas. And so I grouped by month and year and then pasted in uh, the, that uh, uh, sum that I had already created. So that way I wasn't uh, manually typing in it. And then I just did some more manual stuff. Uh, and that, that code there gave me that final, uh, on the right, you see the text column there. And that allowed me to then start plotting my data. So I plotted a static background layer. Uh, with, with this code and it really just included like what I wanted for my Y and X axes and my labels for my um, for each axis and my title and my legend. And then I plotted the dynamic uh, animated layer and got my uh, animation, which is really exciting. Uh, I used some stuff in GM text in order to nudge out the data. You can also use padding, but I wanted to do it really specifically because it only occurred sometimes where these labels were overlapping. And so part of the reasons why I made some of these decisions, um, I wanted to talk about just briefly with my remaining time, uh, because I made very specific decisions um, as they were informed by human factors, which is an entire field of research that's dedicated to how humans interact with technology. Uh, and for most of us, that's normally around data visualizations. So the whole idea behind this, uh, these different human factors principles is reducing noise to allow you to present more information. So in R, um, most of us have seen this background at some point in time where there's this gray background, which can be helpful, uh, but not always. 
And that goes off of this principle called beta to ink ratio. So the amount of ink that you have on your visualization should be meaningful. So everything that you put in there should be deliberate and anything that doesn't have meaning should be kept to a minimum. Uh, and so in this case, it wasn't helpful to have that background. So I took it out and I actually took down the number of colors so that way we could really, really focus on that blue line for 2020. This leads into one other principle I wanna briefly talk about called consistency. And it, it seems to make sense, you know, we, I think we all know what consistency means, but in terms of human factors, it's this idea of having a standard position. Uh, in psychology, we like to think of it as that humans have developed these expectations about where things have gone and we do these things very quickly. So we'll quickly learn that the lines are moving and so we'll have this expectation that the label should be following that line. And so in order to build that out with the code I just showed, it was quite difficult because it wanted to jump around and move, move all over the place. But in order to get it to follow and follow these different principles of human factors, uh, we needed it to be uh, coded specifically. Um, you can also do this with color and the, the way that you show color throughout your visualization. So I have the blue line at the top and R does that automatically, which is really nice. Uh, and then the blue line for my, my actual 2020. Um, but then the last one that I wanted to talk about was minimizing information access costs. So this is the idea that people shouldn't have to move their head around. They should just be able to scan something with their eyes. And then you want to have limited mental operations. Uh, so in order to do this, this is why I put those visual or those labels on because I didn't want people to feel like they wanted to pause my visualization and calculate what changed month to month. I wanted it to be readily available uh, so that no mental operations were happening and then get that cumulative filings on the Y axis as well. Um, and then just to summarize, uh, you can also level up your visualizations by thinking about cultural shortcuts. So as a culture, we have these pre-existing expectations. For example, uh, when you see bright colors in your environment, specifically red, it normally is a means to warn you or it might mean to stop. And so you can think about that as you create your visualizations in order to convey meaning without using words. And so then you have more uh, to your visualization and more meaning conveyed without cluttering it. Thanks for listening. Awesome, Laura. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. I there there's so much in there that's like yes, that like these are so important to help make these things more effective. One thing I I do that with the case one a lot, where I'm like, here here's this and this and this, and like I end up in these things a lot. And I I you know I do it the way you showed a lot. But one thing I've I had someone say to me, and I was like, oh, I think you're right. Is that if it's getting really like a lot. Um, that, that, that might be a mental note to myself sometimes to say, should this be a join instead? Like, should I make a little separate data set of like the things I need and then just like join it up and like, would it end up being easier for me to come back to later and read it like later it led to be like, what was I doing here? Right. <laughs> and like, if it, if I had like a little separate data frame up, up above that like had the stuff that I needed to add into and then do like an inner join. Um, that's, that's uh, when you said that, when you, you were like, I'm doing this and like, is this good? You know, cause I, I end up in that exact same situation. And that's something that someone said to me sometimes. I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's a good reminder sometimes. That's great. Thank anyway, you. <laughs> although I am a, a very great user of case when like all the time. Well, yeah, I think that for this, I, will, I, I had started with making things deliberate and then never really went back to see how I could update it. And so now I've started using um, animations for other things. And uh, when, you know, when you look back at your code, you're like, oh, I should probably update this process at some point. But yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's that that was, a good direction to go to. Yeah, yeah, that was really, um, it was such an interesting data set and also like such a great example of how um, to use those kinds of animations in so many different situations. So um, I am so proud of our speakers. We're going to get out on time. Our last speaker of the day is Greg Snow. And Greg is going to um, give um, us a talk. He's going to speak about um, how to deal with de-identified de um, data sets and specifically talk about cryptog cryptographic hashing and, um, and what it is and how to use it in that context. So thanks so much, Greg. I think I have my mute off and everything ready to go. So um, I'm Greg Snow, uh, Intermountain Healthcare, a uh, longtime uh, member of the our users group and that. Um, but this came out as, as a challenge. Uh, this is kind of an interesting project that I got involved with last year. 
is basically the idea is that group A and group B have data on a large number of people. The two sets overlap, but neither is a subset of each other. Uh, group A is willing to share additional fields with group B, and the best way to link the two records for the same person is using social security numbers. Um, but we know social security numbers are very sensitive. If you just send out a bunch of social security numbers, you get in all types of trouble from that. Uh, so the question becomes how to match social security numbers between the two data sets without either group giving as is in information to the other about the non-shared subjects. Um, so in this case, I'm actually, I'm the, the one doing the work for group B. And so if group A were to just send me all their data, then the people who we don't share in that, they've just given me social security numbers of people that I have no rights to do it. Um, you know, I could send them a list and say, well, here's all the social security numbers I have, just send me the data on them. But then I'm sending them social security numbers on people that, that they don't have. And so, you know, either way we're getting in trouble. So how do we do this? Well, the answer turns out to be, or one answer, the answer we use is cryptographic hashing. And since I don't know how many people out there are experts on that, I want to give a, a quick view for those that don't know of what really is hashing. And so a, a simple hash is just we're relating the characters we want to use, we're turning those into numbers. So probably the simplest hash there is, is you know, you learn this in grade school when you first learned about making codes to give a note to your friend is, you know, A equals one, B equals two, C equals three, down to Z equals 26. If you need, you know, spaces and punctuation, you add those on there. Um, and then we're just gonna convert each letter to a number um, and add them all up. And if we want to make it a little bit harder, we'll add in what's called a, a salt or a key. Um, and then to, to really kind of make things fancy or other things we can do with it, we're just going to take the last two for my simple example or n digits uh, to kind of wrap things around. Okay. Um, so here's the simple hash example. Um, I've just used the built in letters thing, uh, split apart my last name and then do my lookup table. And so S gets the value 19, N gets the value 14, O is 15, um, 23, all those add up to uh, to be 71. Um, and so my, uh, you know, my actual uh, uh, hashed number here is I'm gonna sum those values, add in salt, which I chose as 42 being the ultimate answer to life, the universe, everything. Uh, use the mod operator to give, give me just the last two digits. Uh, so in this case, snow hashes to the number 13. Uh, but just to show is uh, if I use a different salt, uh, Greg can also be made to hash to 13. So hashing is a many to one operation, which actually makes it impossible or at least very hard to reverse it. If I just give you the number 13, uh, there's no way to know is was that snow with a salt of 42 or greg with a salt of 76. Uh, so if i keep that that salt piece secret there's no way to map this back and you can even see with the same salt is if you just reorder the uh you know in snow if we change that to wands reverse the order it's still going to be the, the same value um, but this allows us to to turn the identifiable information into uh, other information uh, where the identity is masked. Okay, cryptographic hashing is a lot more complicated, um, and I'm not the expert on on this. Uh, but you know, computer science people can can tell you more about all the algorithms that go into it. Um, but essentially, it works on the individual binary digits, the zeros and ones, and instead of just you know converting an A to a one, you, it you know you convert uh, the word to the binary representation. So, you know, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, you know, whatever like that. But then the hashing will actually take individual bits and swap them or rotate sections or reverse sections and do really complicated things. And it's based on the key or salt you put into as to which gets swapped, which gets rotated and things like that. And so just to show an example here, so I'm using the library digest. It has some of these hashing options. Um, so if I say hash, uh, the word snow, 
using the, the solver Kia 42 and the algorithm SHA1, uh, then we get this nice long sequence of values out here. And I just showed the others is just small changes. You get a very big difference in the hash. So you're not going to say it's like, oh, this looks very similar to this other social, you know, hash version of the social security number. So they must be similar. No, you get completely different things. Uh, so basically what we're doing with these now, uh, so group A is going to generate a key and zip file password and that download site public uh, password. Um, we combine the social security number with last name, date of birth, and zip code in, in three different uh, things. And then we use the key to create the hash for each combined column, uh, merge in our other data, remove the identifiers, um, put the, uh, the data into a zip file and upload that to a secure download site, and then send the, the passwords to group B. So I get those as separate emails. My site group B is I take my data, again, combine social security number with last name, date of birth, zip code. Um, then I use the, the key that I received uh, in a you know separate email to create the same hash. So if I've got a matching person with the same zip code and last name using the same key, I will get the same hash. It just won't have any of that original data in it. Um, then I download and un unzip the data and then merge the two data sets um, to, uh, to see now. So ev everybody that matches between the two groups uh, can match there. Um, but this works because we're never sharing social security numbers. Um, because the hashes are many to one, uh, we can't really back transform them. Um, brute force, you could try every combination of social security number and name and get some candidates but you could end up with duplicates. And, you know, part of the agreement is that I won't do that. And it probably would take more years than I have left in, in my life to actually do that usefully. Um, so it's, it's pretty secure and pretty safe and everybody seems to be happy with it. Um, so it, it works pretty well. I, I mean, I am confirming some people with social security numbers, but that's because I already know their social security numbers. Um, what can go wrong? Well, there are misspellings, typos, lying. It would be nice if, if in every case we had zero or three matches, uh, but in truth, we had one match and two match groups, uh, probably due to misspellings and typos. Um, there is a small chance uh, that because of many to one is two people, their uh, social security and name or birth date or zip code combination could lead to the same hash. Um, but the hashes are 160 bits long. So that works out to be 1.4 times 10 to the 48th power is the, the number. I don't even think that level of numbers have names anymore. Maybe it is. It's less than a Google, but you know, more than quintillion or septillion or whatever those are. Um, our particular group is we're merging 100 million records with 9 million records. And so that's only about 9 to the times 10 to the 14th power. Um, so several differences in order of magnitudes. So while that's possible, I think that's going to happen pretty rarely. Um, and so that was, you know, the solution that, that we found to the way to merge on social security numbers without ever sharing social security numbers. Nice. That is super interesting. Super interesting. I, um, uh, you know, like I've, I've, I've learned about hashing, like in the, you know, in the context of like files, you know, like, can you check that the file is, has changed or not, or, or like, or like feature hashing and machine learning, like using a hash as a feature instead of like, like, um, like in natural language processing, you can like hash tokens and then use the hash instead of the, um, instead of the words, which it's like, oops, it's much faster and um, uh, you lose interpretability, but it's like wave, it's like super fast and stuff. But the, like, this is super interesting. It's really interesting when certain concepts from computer science or whatever end up having these really interesting applications. You can like learn about them once and then like see how they're used in all these different ways. 
Um, amazing. So those were our, um, our talks. Um, I'll see, I think, um, uh, Laura, if you're still around and able to unmute, um, there was a question in the chat for you about um, maybe like how you started learning about human factor research around data visualization and if you have any resources to recommend. Yeah, um, so my background is in uh, cognitive neuroscience. So there was lots of human factors researchers that I work with. Actually, one of them is on the call, uh, which is pretty cool. And so um, I definitely have some resources. Julia, do you want me to just send it to you and you can send it around? Um, uh, yes, I can, I'll put it as a comment on this month's, um, or you okay. can actually put it as a comment on this okay. month's um, meetup. Uh, so we can do either one of those um, to okay. get them out to people. So that will be, um, maybe that'll be the easiest way to get that out. Is that good yeah, for you? Some easy articles and things like that that are, it's nice. Um, but there's these like principles that really help with um, my thinking and my process when I'm making a visualization that's going to be interpreted by whoever. Uh, and so I really like to lean on those principles. Awesome. That would be super great, Laura. Thank you for sharing those resources with us. No um, any last call on questions for these um for our speakers. I think that was such a really, it was really interesting seeing the like connections that were between them. Really interesting to see um, what a um, variety of things people are working on. Um, I, I know people were from a variety, like our audience is from a variety of places, but these speakers are all people from our local Utah, Salt Lake City, our community. It's really exciting. You know, we haven't been physically together now for like a year. Um, so it's really great to be able to hear what people are working on. And I, I'm really thankful for that, um, that opportunity. Um, so before we head out on time, even, I'm, I'm just really happy about this. I'm just going to uh, drop the link for next month's meeting. So our March, our March meeting um, is scheduled um, and it is uh, with another one of our, um, our local Salt Lake our users and he's going to be talking about a little bit about like process how we can be more effective um, our coders using um, tools in the specific um, our studio ide how we can use tools that are within the art ide the our studio ide to be um uh, uh better faster um uh, more efficient more accurate um, people who write our code so i encourage you to um check out that date um see if you're able to come um, for that. And um, I think that's our only, um, uh, that's our only announcement. Um, and so I thank you all again so much for coming and I will look forward to seeing you, um, to seeing you next time. So see you then. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm going to shut down the meetings.